visual art scene in India and how uh, an artist and a dear friend uh, have uh, known for a while and have followed her art and her practice and uh, her life um, has made the shift from being an art writer in Singapore and a practicing artist here to a full-time artist in Chennai and exhibiting all over India as well and hopefully the world next. Um, Parvati was, when I met her, she was, I, I was a freelance writer at that time, and we'd meet at these arts events uh, covering similar things, and uh, at some point, um, I'm not sure if many of you know, she was, uh, even though she was the writer, she was sort of also was like a commissioning editor for a lot of arts writers in Singapore, and I think has kick-started along a lot of uh, careers of people who want to write about the arts and has um, and very graciously you know, welcomed them and gave them um, pieces to write and, and, and I, I definitely um, owe her a lot for you know pushing me on my way as a as an arts writer and writing about theater and performing arts and um, soon after that or at least a few years after that, and I, you know, which exhibited a few times here in Singapore. At um, I think one was at Post Gallery. That was the last one that you did before you left. It was, um, and there was another one at Four Seasons Gallery. I think that was a little different. Yeah, yeah. Um, And then um, she was awarded the Chevening Scholarship to go to uh, Goldsmiths College, Central St Martins in London, to do a Masters in Fine Arts. But you did your basic degree at Stella Maris, right? Yeah, okay. Your art degree at Stella Maris in Chennai. Um, and then came back to Singapore, and um, I guess the pull of the homeland, personal reasons, she moved to Chennai and has since you know, made an impact for sure in the art scene there, has been curated by a lot of um, important um, curators in the Indian art scene. Um, exhibited by a lot of important galleries, Gallery Veda, Ambara Galleries in Chennai. Um, and uh, we're here, and I'll save this news for last, there are, there are big things happening in terms of a, a Vienna. But, um, so anyway, to just to, what I, what maybe, what Parvati and I decided is that, um, since many of you may have not seen her art, um, she'd give you a quick run through of, um, of her work and, of her latest exhibition, The Amb Ambiguity of Landscapes, which uh, showed as part of the Art Chennai uh, Art Festival in, um, that took place in February, March time frame, mm -hmm. and it was one of the highlights of Art Chennai. And I was there, and unfortunately I was there for the opening, I was there the day before when it was being set up, and you know, it, it was it was really major exhibition in terms of you know scope of work. There was every there was a lot of uh, video installations. There was um, uh, mixed media. There was uh, pencil and drawing, which obviously part is a uh, very keen. Um, um, it's been a, a big part of your practice. Mm -hmm. in this way. Um, so she'll take you a little bit through um, the ambiguity of landscapes, and then we can. Um, I can ask her a few questions, and then afterwards, since it's all a nice, um, intimate space and a uh, number of people, we can we can do a Q and A. If any of you have uh, questions to ask her about what it means to be um, an Indian, um, a contemporary artist in current day India, which is, I guess, even more pertinent given what happened in the elections last week. So, um, if anyone, would you like to go and do your presentation? Now? Yeah. yeah. Or uh, is there? Yeah, I, I mean, really, thank you all of you for sparing the time for being here this afternoon. And I'm really looking forward to this, to sharing, you know, my art with all of you. As Sangeeta has very graciously introduced me, I used to live in Singapore for a very long time, writing about the arts for the Business Times. And then I moved, I also painted and wrote, and I've lived in London, in Jakarta, obviously in India, and Singapore the longest time. Um, and it's been a journey with the art and with the writing and being involved with the arts as a way of giving back to society, whether it's through the writing about the arts or with the art itself. And, you know, it's, it's really a pleasure and a privilege truly to be able to share this with you today. And like any presentation, let me start with a quotation from James Joyce from Ulysses, which says, 
art has to reveal to us ideas, formless spiritual essences. The supreme question about a work of art is out of how deep a life does it spring. So for me, art is very much an extension of life, of a lived existence in the world. And my art deals, you know, it sort of, currently it stands at that point between you think, oh, that looks like an abstract image, but the game being played is that it's not an abstract image. It is an image of the body or the landscape, but seen through uh, a microscope or a telescope through different levels of perception. So what I'm trying to make you see is the world that you know very well. This is not a fantasy. This is not some esoteric, don't know what kind of world. This is the world we live in. And what my art does to show us, you, me, I, I, the body, in this world around us, whether it is the city we live in, the universe we live in, the subatomic realm of atomic particles we live in, but me and the universe, that's what my art is about. And I thought I would start off by showing you some images from a solo show that just finished, uh, which, is called, which was called The Ambiguity of Landscapes. If we could turn off the lights. Um, and, you know, this is which this was the image we used to kind of promote the show, which looks like a chair on the edge of a cliff. You know, it has that whole thing of, you know, gazing into the void, the sublime, the... But actually, it's, it's, it's a part of my drawing. And the chair is a toy chair, which my daughter plays with which is perfectly made and I've kept it on my artwork and re-photographed it. So it immediately calls into question scale. What are you looking at? Are you looking at a photograph? Are you looking at a child's toy? Are you looking at a work of art? Or at an intervention into a work of art? And you know, that's why, um, you know, I would like for you, the work doesn't give itself easily. You can't look by and say, oh, pretty flower and move on. Neither is it sort of so esoteric you think, really, I, it says nothing to me, I don't want to deal with it. What I would like to do is to hook you into the work and then hopefully have a dialogue between you and the work because any work of art I feel isn't complete unless the viewer engages in a dialogue with it. It proposes and then if you as the viewer find that proposition interesting, you will respond to it and then a dialogue happens. So. Um, that was um, so this was just an opening image from ambiguity of landscapes and as you walked into the gallery this was one of the first images you saw and there's another image that will follow which looks like a forest of trees where you know the trees the leaves have fallen off but actually it's the spinal cord it's the bundle of nerve fibers in your body where information is gathered processed and released uh, it's called core and the next image which I'm afraid it's this is not working which looks like caves are actually a particular kind of bone in the body called spongy bones um, and if we could go just to the next slide which shows you somebody kind of to give you some sense of scale it's about six feet high and a feet and a half long and the idea of was that you walked in and you saw this and you thought oh landscape and then you paused a while and then you realized it really wasn't a landscape outside the body, but a landscape inside the body. And it's that sense of scale that, you know, I, that people were sort of engaging with that they went and they thought they were looking at something, but then realized they were looking at something else. And just to give you uh, some idea of this technique, it is, it's a process of dotting. You know, these are wooden panels and the black is entirely pencil. It's just a pencil mark, a dot that is, you know, repeated over and over and over again. You, you know, it's, it's almost a meditative process. You know, somebody sort of coming to the studio will hear this sort of knocking of pencil against wood all the time. And, you know, people ask me, isn't it boring? But it isn't, just as meditation isn't boring. It's, it's a process, it's a meditative process. I find that, you know, this whole process of creating something is is a discipline in itself and in a way that's why drawing has become the sort of core practice of what i do because it's you know where drawing is a verb and 
a, a noun. There's the process of drawing and there is the drawing itself. And you don't hide behind everything. Any dot that you make is there visible on, on this piece of wood for you to see. Um, and I also just wanted to sort of say that, you know, there, um, that the, especially, they actually come from two different series, though, this, though they look similar. The series on the, the left, the, the spinal column, came from a series called Spine, which was created originally on a series, on an exhibition about gender. Now, a lot of art can be very political and very in your face, and there is a role and a need for that kind of art. But you can also suggest at, uh, at things in the real world in more subtle ways. So for me, I was talking about women and gender, but through various notions of the spine to suggest that, well, at one level, a woman is, you know, the backbone, the, the central focal point of, of society. Perhaps also to say that women need more backbone if they have to resist and fight back against the things happening to them. Also, the idea of spine as a nervous system where information is gathered, processed, and given out again. So there are latent socio-political, cultural notions in the work that I do. Uh, very often they are revealed by the context of the show or where they are seen. There's very often text that goes with it. Um, and in, in that way, the art is a reflection of society. Drawing is probably the oldest art form. You know, the caveman who drew a line across the floor, he was, he wasn't, you know, he was the first artist probably. But the images that, so I'm dealing with probably the oldest art form that exists, but this work is of this time and it can only be of this time because these images of our art time, they are from the cutting edge of science and technology. They are images given by scanning, you know, tunneling electron microscopes by images sent by NASA. And these images are then mediated again by me and brought back into a cultural space. So that's why I feel that it's this combination again of old and new. Um, could we have? So then we went in, in this show, we went into a series of three works, which was called Under the Skin, uh, which each of these are actually um, images. These are this, this is what gives color to your skin, the, you know, the pigment uh, cells. So again, you know, at one level, they were kind of very beautiful, seemingly abstract images. But at the uh, at second level, I mean, this was a very powerful work with which a lot of people engage because, you know, uh, it, there's also writing around the sides of the work, which are taken from the fairness cream industry, from Bob Dylan's songs, from Rosa Parks, which sort of suggest, you know, was inviting the viewer to contemplate the fact that it is these cells in our bodies, in your body and my body and every human being's body, whether it was there or present or absent in whatever degree, which has shaped so much of human history, whether it's the slave trade or white supremacy or, you know, the, the desirability of a fair bride, you know. So it, it, it suggested that, you know, our body does control our destiny in many ways, but under the skin, this is all there is that differentiates us. Um, then we, you know, I mean, uh, again, there was a running through the sh show. Again, I mean, the body is composed of water. I mean, a large part of our body is water, and there's water outside the body. So, you know, there was a whole series of videos. I will end my presentation with one little video on water, and if it's terribly boring, we'll stop midway through and continue the conversation. But, you know, water in various iterations, you know, ran through the show, again, as a way of linking what's within and without the body. And, you know, water, it's, you know, it's reduced to an essence here of waves and, you know, uh, ripples. But water is, again, a highly contested uh, subject, whether it's in Singapore or in India. You know, water doesn't know political boundaries but political boundaries are imposed on it. In Chennai, when I go back from Singapore, there is no drinking water in the taps. In summer, we buy water. You know, it's, it's an endless sight of people queuing up with plastic buckets on the street to, just to have drinking water. So um, the video that I will show at the end is, has the soundtrack of dripping water. So when you enter the studio, what you heard was the sound of 
you know, dripping water overlaid with sounds of the sea and the rain. And a lot of people who came in sort of thought, ah, oh, there's a dripping toilet somewhere, we must really, I mean, you know, thought. And then they kind of went into that space and said, we've got to find where this water is. And it was sort of a link element through the show that became very interesting. This, if you, uh, was also from the show, I mean, uh, which I wanted to sort of say was, again, the particularity of an individual and society, which was, you know, the story of Ramanujam as a story from east to west, um, fascinated me as, um, you know, uh, the whole romanticism of, of, the, of the scientist who was a prodigy, who came from extremely impoverished belongings and whose mathematics still, still shapes the way, uh, it still shapes our life. So it, the idea of the individual and the journey in, is something that repeats in many of my works. So if I was to deconstruct this work for you, um, there's this postage stamp of Ramanujam on the left-hand side and on the extreme uh, right-hand panel on top. Um, it's not very clear, but I do have a catalogue if you want to take it later and look at the works. Is a map of Cambridge where he went to. But the map is transparent. Through it, you can see the Namakal Devi because he believed that his science was the Devi sitting on his tongue and inspiring him. Um, then it sort of comes all the way back to you know the modern ATM from where we draw out money, and it's sort of said that it's because of his mathematics that the ATM can recognize the different notes and the money we draw from. And so the story is it's many it's many layered. You know there is the the disappearing man, which is an image from surrealism, which sort of grew to prominence when he died at the time. So I'm also setting him in world events, even though he and surrealism per se had nothing to do with each other. But that's the interesting part of art, you know, things that are separated by time and geography and history can come together and converse on my canvases, if you like. And um, this, is, this was a whole series, this is a Google map, and this particular Google map is a fragment of uh, Kolkata in India. And, you know, Lands. So in, at some level, I would say that I do deal with the old-fashioned things of, you know, body and landscape and human beings, except that they are through prisms of science and technology. Um, you know, when you look at this Google map, it's so abstract, but yet it is real. You know, it's, it stands for very real places and things and people live and move there. And it also suggests at surveillance that, you know, um, what we do and say can be seen from very high up and seen and monitored and controlled. At the same time, there's a peculiar innocence to the fact that this is, you know, this is a habitation of human beings that's, you know, compressed into this black and white image. Um, I think the geographical move for me from Singapore to India forced me to look at place a lot more, um, uh, a lot more seriously in my art because I personally was being dislocated and the place that I lived in Singapore and the place that I was going to India had similarities I mean you know but there was you know it, it was visually and emotionally such a different physical impact that I started drawing this landscape in many different ways and the Google map is you know just one of the ways I started drawing it and again, you know, with uh, by the time in the show, by the time people came to this, because they were, you know, this whole thing of ambiguity of landscapes, they would show this was something inside the body, and then, you know, then they discovered, no, this was actually, you know, the landscape in some way. So it was, apart from anything else, it was a fun show. People were having fun going through this and playing with scale. Now, the Ramanujan panel was about uh, 9 to 10 feet big. This is about 9 inches big. So it's kind of, you know, there was a play of scale, different registers. So you constantly were moving back and forth bodily to engage with the work. This you came up close to and looked at. The Ramanuja work is that, oh, you step back and let it, you know, empower you or overpower you. And, you know, so with the drawings, I'm also trying to make it an interactive thing. You know, interactivity in art is not necessarily just about video or going and punching buttons. If you're sensitive to what you're seeing and you're engaged with it, you are physically moving back and forth with different registers in the work, 
to be a part of the work. And this work, I mean, I also showed for the first time drawing uh, photographs, which I've taken for a very long period of time. And it's always been details that interested me, you know, little, you know, so that, that's sort of the, the grills on my window, the, the again, there in there, you know, there's, there's a pavement tile, a floor mat, things that you ignore, you know, details which are part of your domestic, also, you know, well, that's this sort of, uh, imagery from temples as well, though you wouldn't recognize it as such, and uh, from industrial images. So, you know, that the sort of breaking of barriers between these various levels and showing you sort of details which could stand in for the whole or, you know, were just an abstract detail in of itself. It was called geometry of the everyday, you know, things in the everyday world around you. And I also took some of those, I mean, with the lights, you can't see them very clearly. Anybody who's really interested, there is a catalog and you can come and look through it. I paired some of these photographs with actual drawings. And I think one of the clearest that you might see is the second one, which sort of on the top, it's silk fibers. And that's hand drawn and hand painted under a microscope. What is underneath was, you know, an image of gunny sacks in the sun in a coffee factory. So there were sort of visual or emotional or other resonances between the photos and the work. So this is, you know, this is a floor map. This is, you know, a slice of a plant showing the sort of distribution of water inside a plant. That is, uh, you're looking through a, a pipe in a factory that manufactures cryogenic tubes, cryogenic containers. That is a sunspot on the, you know, an image of the sun on the left. So it was either visual or actual resonances. And I will, um, the second last thing that I will sort of end with in this is to say that this show also, you know, sort of coming back full circle, sort of, it engaged with the writing as well. You know, when I went back to India, uh, given the fact that I now had a daughter and I was doing, I'd set up a studio and was doing the art full time the arts writing sort of became a little less, but I did find time to do more creative writing and more poetry. And this is an artist book, which comes back to the first image that, that you saw, which that image was used in this book. So it's, it's a one-off, there's only sort of, I will only ever make say eight books like this. And it's also has elements of my poetry in it. And the ideas of, you know, you, maps are very often accordions that you fold out and look at. And, you know, there was this art groups called the Situationists, which had this really interesting experiment of a man following a map and going through a city and not finding his way. The city becomes increasingly strange because it's the wrong map for the right city. So sort of very sort of subtly taking that, it's the idea of things splintering apart and coming together. And it's called mappings and it's sort of set up as an installation where you know, you could walk around it and read the poetry. And there was also, you know, a, a custom made acrylic box inside which the entire full poem was also there should somebody want to pick it up and read it. So that was Mappings, um, which was for me a very satisfying coming together of images and text because um, all my life I've dealt with text and image in different ways and they come together with one privileged over the other sometimes, and in this it was a nice um, mixture of the two. So I think that sort of gives you a flavor of the art and what I do. Um, and I will leave you with a tiny little, we can, we can see all or something of the video. Can we see that? Um, which was a whole, actually it was an installation, which I'm only showing one of, there was four videos, which again subtly deals with if we could go really, can we switch off the lights at this point? It would be nice just to see it. Which, you know, dealt with the fluidity of water. You know, there was ice and boiling water and moving water in multiple video screens that you could uh, come to and see. And it, you know, spoke about this changing nature of water and, you know, the fluidity of water and of identity, but also in a very um, hopefully interesting and visually appealing way.
The whole installation was called An Ocean in Every Kitchen. And this was sort of me filming the ice. Everything in, these, in this video came from my kitchen, whether it was the ice or the water or the steam or the countertop, or you will see sort of food coloring. Um, and in this same sort of room where the videos were shown, there was also an image. I also do images of, of the surf, of where the sea breaks against the sand, and you have these endless traceries of surf. And so the roar of the sea was, you know, was there sort of subtly not in the videos, but in the room. And there's also a notion of time, where the dropping of water sets time. And when it goes into the boiling water, there are two time registers. On one, the film is moving forward, and on the other, it's moving backwards. Um, it's sort of also, um, I would say, a, a factor of contemporary Indian art that artists are expected to or can engage in different media. Now that can, you could e either take it as a positive thing, which is, you know, a performance artist can be asked to do a work of public art. You know, you are expected to, to be familiar with, or you can be familiar with different media and play with different media. Or, you know, you could sort of say, well, it's, you know, a bit daunting that, you know, you also have to be as proficient in one thing or the other. I feel that in many ways it allows one to free oneself for example, for me, the videos and the photography, I really truly see it as an extension of the drawing practice of using, these are not elaborate setups, this is me sort of playing with things outside and inside, of using, you know, the camera like a gorilla camera and taking images and putting it together to make something larger than the individual pieces. So um, there was also a piece of animation in this, in the show, which you know, where a drawing literally came to life, where I worked with an animation studio. So it was also, you know, a way of dealing with other creative people and putting things together. For some reason, this is not working. It's lovely. So I'll start the presentation with that and um, well, invite I questions. Just <laughs> that, that is as hypnotic as it looks on the screen, especially in a white gallery space. And people, everyone who passed by would just stop. And it's like, it's like watching those internet cat videos. You just can't take your eyes away. You just stand there for a little while. And, and uh, especially as, as noisy a city as Chennai is, you just want yes. to stop and just yes. listen to the, the sound of the water and just look at something. Which, you know. Well, I'm, I meant to say this earlier, but I, I saved this quote for, um, for my question, not only for this conversation. Um, I mean, if any set of artworks deserves uh, the quote, the, the William Blake quote, uh, to see the world in a grain of sand, um, it would be yours, by would be. So, um, congratulations again on, on all your success in the last couple of years. And before that, um, your art has, you know, between Singapore and um, the visit to India and back has um, has changed quite dramatically, and mm. it's, it's sort of, in a way, almost reduced to its essence, and mm. it's gotten. Mm -hmm. um, more and more intimate and small, and uh, but still the, the ideas are, you know, the ideas are much, even mm -hmm. bigger than mm -hmm. the ones that you used to tackle in your past artworks. Is it um, a result of your, your your personal journey as an artist, or is it the fact that you were in su you were in such different places over these last few years with different landscapes, different um, cultural traditions, um, different yeah. art scenes? Sure. Yeah, I think, you know, like I said, I think the art, uh, for me, for the art to be, uh, it, it might be a truism, but I think the art really is an extension of the artist. So when I move, when I change, when my landscapes change, when the situations that I am in change, um, the art responds to that in some way, which is not to say it's, it's nothing and it keeps changing, but there are those uh, these changes that come from the place that you are in and the experiences that you've had. Um, you know, I feel, for example, my time with the Business Times as an arts journalist was also very important in shaping the art because art doesn't sort of, the art just in the ivory tower is no longer a valid, uh, I think, uh, um, way of 
being an artist. So the time with the Business Times, it allowed me to meet sort of very many great minds, you know, whether it was filmmakers or architects or artists from Rem Koolhaas to James Rosenquist and to have the liberty to talk to them and say, well, you know, why do you create and how do you create, which, you know, when you sort of see them otherwise, you don't really have that carte blanche to walk up to them and ask them these questions. So I feel, yes, the art sort of evolved and grew and changed as I changed maybe and as my environment changed and as the opportunities changed, you know, um, because, you know, what the, the projects that you're given, the curators that you work with, the, the place that you work with will also stimulate your art if you allow it to, as with a writer or with, with anybody, you know, if you allow those changes to be a positive thing, um, you know, they say tax, taxation and change are the only two constants in the world. So if you allow those constants to be a positive thing, I think death, it grows. Death and taxes. <laughs> <laughs> um, it also has gotten a lot more monochrome. I mean, your early works, some of which I have at home, are very colorful, multi, the mixed media, but, you know, like multi-layered. But now they've, um, they've gotten sort of, you've worked a lot in black and white. I mean, the video is different, obviously. Yeah, I do a lot of black and white work. Uh, I've actually always drawn, but you know, believed in this hierarchy of you draw and then you paint. And even now some people would say, well, so you're going to put some colors over this work. And I say, no, this is what it is and this is where it is. I think London made a big difference to that in the sense that, you know, your tutors constantly push you and sort of say everything that you're doing is terrible and you have to redo it. And then you say, oh, and you go back. But they would constantly say, oh, you're a good draftsman, you know, you know that. And, and I was exposed to people like Paul Noble, who only show drawings. I mean, this Paul Noble's exhibition I went to, it was in Whitechapel, I believe. And it was room upon room of these, of just drawings. And it was so fascinating. And it, again, now it seems sort of obvious, but I thought, oh, you can have a drawing practice and a painting practice. And it doesn't, there is the hierarchy that you're brought up with of thinking one should follow the other no longer is there. And, you know, I'd always done, the, the drawings came from these sort of scientific drawings. I, I love science. I love popular science. I feel, um, you know, uh, that through the art, what I'm really trying to ask are these questions of why are we here? What are we doing? What's our place in the world? Questions where, you know, that seem, that are very dangerous to ask, that can seem terribly sort of sentimental or very uh, twee um, in today's sort of far more um, cynical landscape. And I feel that, this is just personal, but I feel some of these big questions have been taken over by science, by quantum um, physics, where, you know, you, how does the universe come into birth? What, what are we made of? What is matter at its essence? And so for me to take, to use science as a way of bringing these ideas of conversation back into a cultural sphere, because these are questions that matter. I mean, at the end of the day, um, you know, art can be, you know, it can be a game, it can be clever, it can talk to your peers, it can be decorative, it, it can be many things, and it's only right that it's all these many things. But for me, art is a way of posing these questions, and um, science allows me to pose these questions. I know I'm sort of uh, going a little bit away from, from the question, but it sort of led me to, you know, why, how it it developed in this way. So I had these images of these cloud chamber particles, which I loved. I thought it was so beautiful because they were, they were these cloud traceries like you saw at the back of the Ramanujam work where there are particles that are so small you can't see them, you can't photograph them. You can only photograph their interactions with other particles. And these collisions create these traceries. So the idea of collisions creating knowledge and uh, presence and absence, you, you, you're drawing something that isn't there. And it sort of started, so the dot for me, I mean, you can trace it back to pointillism, but for me it was also the idea of the punctum or the point or the tiniest indivisible particle that whose endless iterations create the universe and whose endless dotting in my work creates the artwork. So I think the drawing will always be a core part now of my practice, but sort of color is coming back in again in, in different ways. Um, you know, there is some video, there's some photography, and it's, I think it's 
it sort of came to something very sort of condensed and it's now opening up again and I don't know what really the future holds but I think drawing will always be there but it might include other things as well. How do Indian curators react to your art? Do, do they, can they grasp it? Because it's, it, Indian art has, a, has, at least in the old days when you had the schools of art and everyone came from a certain school, you were the Bengal school, or you, you, know, you went to the JD mm -hmm. school, um, in, or the Baroda school. Um, and and it seems to have moved away from that, but um, have the curators accepted this, uh, you know, all these ideas that you're posing in your art, and um. Um, do they want to accept it? <laughs> no, I think the drawings have found, because it's, I think the, um, the oh, urgency the or the <laughs> sincerity or the passion, it's, it's an often used, behind the work I think is very visible, the intensity of the work is quite visible. But it is also in some ways niche, as I suppose every art in its way is niche. So uh, I think art today in India, it's, it's not really so much, I mean the big schools are still Baroda and JJ and Shanti Niketan, but the artists tend to deal with things with a socio-cultural, maybe even a socio-political cultural realm. So there would be artists who would deal with urbanization in the city, who would deal with history, who might deal with gender. So it's no longer per se the schools, but different themes that of, the, of society that, that the artists deal with. So yes, the work has found a resonance, not with everyone, obviously, but with, with a lot of curators and uh, with other artists and galleries. Um, yeah. Well, this will be the uh, time to bring up, sorry, just, just a couple more minutes and then we'll, we can take questions. Uh, I just wanted to show um, Parvati's um, creation of this public art installation at the Bombay Airport. If anyone has passed through recently, there's a massive 20 feet. Yeah, it's a 20 foot high um, drawing, drawing, which took a long in time the to do. Of the, of the new Bombay Airport, which was um, commissioned as part of, you know, there's a few artists yeah, who have it's, I mean, work. Uh, it's a huge, can we dim the lights a bit again? It's a huge public, it's a huge art project. I think there's three kilometers of art or something that was undertaken by T2, the new terminal in Bombay, where Rajiv Sethi was the, 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 the person behind the uh, commissioning. It was his vision in collaboration with uh, GBK, of course. And uh, he, you know, sort of, it was a number of visits. This is this work of art is 20 feet high and it's three-dimensional. It's all hand-drawn on pieces of wood. There are 31, it's like a jigsaw, 31 pieces of wood come together to create this. It was so big that it wouldn't fit into my studio and the first time I saw it all together was on the floor of the airport where it was unwrapped and put together. Of course, when it's put up in the airport, though it scans, you know, though it spans two stories, because the airport's so huge, it looks like, you know, a reasonably sized work of art in the airport. And, um, you know, it's, it's public projects like this in, uh, you know, which sort of push artists, you know, I mean, when I look at, you know, this is, it's the intimate work that I do. And suddenly to be, that's what I meant in India, you know, they didn't, sort of, I mean, very luckily Rajiv didn't sort of look at this and say, oh, she does intimate drawings, that's all she can do. He thought, yeah, what if she scales that up and, fill, you know, I was taken to the airport many times and shown this space and said, what would you create there? So. It's nice that you're not typecast into some people will do public art projects, some people will do little watercolors, some people will do this. You know, to be forced into using your ideas and imagination to different scales, uh, I think that's, that's really interesting. The, the work, again, is seemingly abstract. It's actually an outline of Bombay, the whole work. And in the center is this seed pod which, uh, you know, from which this pollen grains are flying out. And the lines coming in are actually what I was describing, these traceries from these clouds, from CERN, from these cloud chamber particles. But it also looks like, you know, in a magazine, when you see the number of flights that come into a city and go out of a city, it sort of has a resonance with that. And around the seed pod, which could be the airport, which could be Bombay, where, you know, energy, people, planes come in and go out, are these maps of Bombay, over the years, you know, from Google Maps to old navigational maps that are cradling, you know, this, this seed part of energy. 
Um, so it was quite an interesting process, you know. So that's some of the detailing on the on the you know. It, it is extraordinarily detailed, and it took How an extra. Long did you take to do the whole project was a year, year and a half. Uh, so this was it being put up and you know you once stood on a cherry picker that was swaying to three you know three uh, stories high and all these workmen would sort of laugh at me because I'd keep saying I'm going to fall off be careful and I'm like no it's all right and I said nay nay I'm going to die for my aunt my girne wala hai and they'd say no relax it's all going to happen in its time so the whole process from you know scaling up and to it eventually being put up and that was at the opening you see it it's on the second floor uh, the best views from the second floor opposite the lounges it was an incredible experience to <laughs> to do this so if you when you go to the new bombay international airport next do have a look and see if you can spot it <laughs> speaking of bombay you have some celebrity fans as well um fakir is one of the artists who was commissioned to do a uh, piece for amitabh bachchan's 70th birthday and uh, the, and her artwork you know also Yeah, covers on these themes as well as the interest in film. So that's the piece that was um, presented to him. And what were his reactions? Yeah, he said he remembered the film. You know, when I was asked to do this again, for me to be fun, it has so to have a from personal. From Zanji, right? From Zanji, which I remembered as a child. You know, Bollywood. That's what I mean. The art is a reflection of society and what people think about and how they are. Uh, I remember as a child that you know Hindi films were very chocolate box heroes and you know happy happy. and then zanjeer came and even for me as a child maybe because at the center of the story is a child seeing his parents being murdered you know the idea of the angry young man which was occupy center space in indian films and indian thought and indian society for such a long time i did feel its impact as a child so i did a work called uh, nine rasas meaning nine emotions uh, where i picked these scenes out of this one movie zanjeer which made created the angry young man and you know created this work as a sort of deconstructed storyboard of the film it was i mean you know uh, in its way it was like being part of indian history a little bit i mean apart from the glamour of course of doing something for amitabh bachchan without a question but uh to be a part of because cinema is the dominant ecosystem you know in india so to i and i do use cinema in we haven't shown i mean if i showed all the works it all be sort of bored and tired but I do deal with cinema in my works as well. So, yeah. Yeah, that's just uh, and I'm sure there will be many more celebrities <laughs> lining up. Oh. Um just a, a quick uh, overview of uh, what you're doing now and what uh, comes next. Um you were at Art Chennai and Art Chennai is one of the uh, every city in India now seems to want um some a big art event. I mean Delhi has two mm. uh, both privately run um Bombay doesn't but has its own kind of gallery association so it has like a kala goda festival kala goda festival but it's so like a multi mm. um you know it's not just not just visual arts it's performance mm. arts mm. um but um the exciting thing about the arts in india is the kochi biennale has gotten mm. very good um, um reviews and you know people have, have gone to watch it and they've, they've really enjoyed and uh, been impressed with the quality of art that was presented there mm-hmm. and we hear that you might be part of the biennale next year yeah. because we've been about that actually this year so oh, it's year. a bit the pressure is on yes it was you know i'd gone to the kochi biennale last its first iteration it was quite incredible really i mean you know both the international and the local art world you know it focused the art attention on india and kochi you know with its historical sort of connotations as a port and as a place which has received you know uh, inputs of foreign visitors and trade from you know certainly from the 15th to the 17th centuries in the past and continuous uh has one of you know the beautiful synagogue has jew town it you know it was just the ideal place really to hold the biennale and the works of art were stunning um it was the brainchild of two artists both krishnamachari and rias komo and you know for a, a, a biennale of this scale to be realized by two artists and to 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 actually be a reality and to this quality of work was quite incredible it really was incredible so yes i've been asked to work for the coming biennale drawings again for the upcoming biennale and i think yeah it's 
it's really, I mean, for me, it's such a privilege and really an honor to, to be part of that. Any more 20 feet pieces? No, no, no. I think maybe something a lot more intimate would be called for. But, but you're right. The, the art, the visual arts in the South where, you know, where it, you know, the power centers of art are really Delhi and Bombay, but now Bangalore, Kerala, Chennai with, you know, art Chennai, which, you know, which is where my solo opened, which, you know, gotten, again, art Chennai has been really good for Chennai in kind of throwing open the city to visual arts. You know, everyone knows about the season in Chennai, which is a classical performing arts, music and dance. Um, contemporary visual arts, less so, but I think if I was going to be a contemporary visual artist in Chennai, this is the best time to be there, really. So, yeah, I think I think there is, I mean, obviously the economic slowdown has an impact on art. There is the obvious link of collectors and buying and commerce and art. Um, and everyone sort of, and maybe there is an impetus now with the new uh, political changes in India. I don't know whether it will have any impact on the art at all. Do you get in trouble if you put Narendra Modi on a painting? Uh, well, since I am not the sort of Narendra Modi on a painting, I have no idea. You might I, draw his face or um, likeness. I don't know. I shall have to wait and see what comes of that. Um, I don't know. Some talk about know. how you know, artists might self-censor and you might not be able to be as open mm. politically. So. I think um, the visual arts, well, I mean, obviously, um, Hussein is is you know the example of Hussein and, and uh, how he sort of had to leave the country is not something that visual artists in India can be proud of at all. But um, I would say that my sense is the focus of culture is still films. You know, far less the performing in visual arts. But having said that, you know, one would just have to wait and see and hope that you know, uh, there is no censorship of art that, because art after all is a way of, of provoking, of, of thinking through ideas, the provoc you know, the provocations need not be big, you know, you don't have to be Damien Hirst and cut up a shark and put it in formaldehyde, the provocations can be small, as I hope with my art, you know, the, you know, the nudging of an idea, the nudging of a belief, the, the slight rupture, the slight dissonances that you might feel that might make you rethink things that's you know that's what art hopes to do um, to 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 make you think and um, you know what an even if an artist is subtly provocative I think it's very different from say a rabble rouser on the street inciting revolt so uh, that's sort of apples and oranges. So I really don't feel art should be censored. I think art should should be left to to raise the questions that it should raise and to ask the questions it needs to ask. And along with it, sort of, you know, also delight and please and, you know, hang in your houses, be part of your life, and also make you think about life in general a little bit. Well, that's a good thought to leave <laughs> on. Um, I'll open any more questions? You raise your hand, sir. Well, uh, at that point, I Yeah, uh, just wanted to thank you for, uh, I thought, uh, what was an interesting presentation. My name is Iftikhar Chaudhry. I'm a fellow at ISAS, but I used to be a Bangladesh diplomat okay. earlier on and uh, lived many thank years you. in Europe and America. Mm -hmm. uh, my daughter went to Port uh, uh, Orleans Institute of Art, which is Why do you call it Indian? What is there in it that makes it different from other uh, uh, mm -hmm. other works of this building? If these were to hang at Tate, for instance, I mean, would they put it in the Indian room or, mm -hmm. or where would the uh, curator uh, place it? I think Indian, at one level, because I am Indian, I, you know, my for me, there are, you know, my identity is very clear. I have. Um, no. But does it come through in your work? work it, you? it, it, it does in a very subtle way, in the sense that there is the Indian impulse to adorn. You know, we love detail. We love the endless iteration the, of, of art 
uh, what, you know, the impulse to to see things in a very detailed way. My art is very detailed, and it's in constant tension or constant balance with a desire for minimalism as well. So, yes, at a very um, as as a, at, a, at a very subtle level and at a very process and conceptual oriented level, this art comes out of me being Indian and growing up in this milieu and being exposed to um, a variety of thought processes that has shaped my aesthetic and my thoughts in many ways. In some cases, the subject matter is overtly Indian, as in with when I deal with Indian cinema or when I deal with Ramanujan. In other cases, the subject matter is not overtly Indian. And I like that because, you know, Indian is a geographical description of me and where I come from. It should not confine my art. Just as, you know, you might have a show of women artists, but that doesn't mean all the work needs, has to deal with gender. It can deal with, you know, it, uh, the fact that you're a woman drawing a single woman drawing or a single mother drawing a particular kind of art, all of that inherently becomes political, social. Uh, it says its thing, but it does not have to be overt, um, is what I feel, you know. Um, I think the work should, you know, if it was showing a Tate, which would be wonderful, it, it could fit in an Indian room, but if they were doing an art, uh, an exhibition of, say, um, contemporary artists dealing with science and art, it should fit into that room as well. So, yeah. I, I'm not being defensive. I mean, I would, I happily call myself an Indian artist, uh, but I don't feel that I need to force the work to be Indian in any obvious way. In its way, if it does become Indian, um, as in being overtly Indian, as in I would deal happily with Ramanujam, for example, in the work. Or I would the, deal the with all the cinema Indian. series. All deals with sort of black and white Indian cinema, and it's very, very overtly Indian. But that is a part of what I do, not everything that I do. I was struck by your discussion of science, mm -hmm. and um, I don't mean to sound rude, mm -hmm. but there's, there's something a little bit naive about it, by which I mean. So sentimental and nostalgic. You look back to Ramanujan, you look back to Carl Chandler, all of which sort of aimed in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. And ever since then, even it's fair to say that not only is science not just science with a, in, the, in the nice textbook kind of sense of mm -hmm. science, but it's better described perhaps as techno science mm -hmm. and one that's deeply corporatized as well. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that to engage with two argue that you're engaging with science today mm -hmm. needs uh, also to address, I think, some of the more, some of the ways in which, shall we say from an Indian point of view, uh, critics of Indian modernity have suggested that mm -hmm. science has in a sense destroyed the environment, uh, mm -hmm. changed the sort of the culture of knowledge, uh, produced, you know, aberrations or distortions mm -hmm. in, in a whole variety of different ways. At a more global level, I think we can see certain mm -hmm. patterns of even what we mean by North and South, Indian versus North mm -hmm. Indian or whatever, uh, being written into a script where science plays an incredibly powerful and non-neutral role. Mm -hmm. So, while, while on the one hand I really understand what you're mm -hmm. doing and I can see why it appeals to you, mm -hmm. I do, you see why I'm suggesting... No, but I would say that that would be a particular kind of engagement with the processes of art, to critique the processes sorry, the processes of science, to critique, you know, the empirical ways in which scientific knowledge is gathered and disseminated. And that would be a particular kind of art, which is not what I'm engaged with. I'm engaged with critiquing uh, and dealing with the imagery that results from this art. So I completely see where you're coming from. That's like saying, my God, you're a woman from Kerala living in India. How can you not deal with with gender, how can you not deal with with these ideas? How can you be, you know, how can you not deal with the political situation in India? And my answer would be, you know, just as there are different kinds of books, I, ref I, I, you know, I would argue back to you and say, you're imposing a value system on my art. My art arises out of a particular value system. I mean, I don't mean to be rude either, but 
you know, you have to, there are different kinds of art and different areas of art that you would deal with. Mm -hmm. The same subject of science would be, could be dealt with by a performance artist in an entirely different way or by, um, you know, by a theater artist. I mean, you have Copenhagen, which a play where, you know, you could say, oh, you know, isn't it too, too beautifully written? It doesn't really actually deal with, you know, the real fallout of nuclear energy and nuclear science. It doesn't, but it's very beautiful and you experience it as a piece of theater. But you also go away thinking. So that's the kind of play that that is. This is the kind of art that mine is. I don't pretend that it is activist art in any shape or form. And neither do I say that I deal with science through the language of science. I deal with science through the language of, uh, of images and through the language of literature. For me, I don't pretend to understand, um, you know, when I'm fascinated with, say, quantum mechanics, it is not the equations, but, but the descriptive analogies that go with it. So again, for me, science is through the paradigm of literature. So I understand where you're coming from. And that's why I say for me, science is a prism. My art is not about science. I use some of the imagery and some of the ideas of science to talk about other things. So my art is very much situated in a socio-cultural milieu it's really not situated in, which is not to say I'm not privileging one over the other, but I'm saying that this is where my art is situated. And I guess nowadays I find it difficult to take the kind of neutralist position that you mm -hmm. are promoting or in a field comfortable doing. I mean, just take the word landscape itself. Mm -hmm. Built into the word is perspective. Mm -hmm. Meaning a landscape is always a, a visual image that comes mm -hmm. from somewhere. Mm -hmm. So if I were to put it a different way and say, well, let's look at your images of the backbone or of skin and all of those things. Mm -hmm. um, you're sh you are occupying a perspective. You mm -hmm. are, you know, sort of mm -hmm. situating yourself very clearly in relation to these things. Mm -hmm. You're not just drawing them. Right? Mm -hmm. And I'm not asking that you must have my politics or you must have even politics at all. Mm -hmm. But just as Copenhagen opens up a whole series of stories about mm -hmm. the and he's not being neutral about nuclear weapons mm. or about Nazi mm. Germany. He's telling you to think about it in a certain mm. way by bringing those things mm -hmm. together. I guess my question to, to you would mm. be, what beyond the aesthetics mm. do you want us to see? I don't think I would uh, necessarily say that I give answers or particular places from which you might call it neutrality. I prefer to call it openness of saying that, you know, say with the skin, I mean, I'm, you know, the works on skin and the use of, say, Dylan's uh, um, words or um, Rosa Parks words or indeed the likeness cream industry. I'm not suggesting that I have the answers to anything. I don't. I'm just proposing questions. I'm not even suggesting that particular places where you need to stand as a viewer. I'm just throwing that open for you. I mean, you know, the death of the author has always, I don't think that really exists, but the fact that I've picked these images and I've edited these images and I'm showing them in a particular way shows a certain authorship over them. But it's not for me to tell you where to stand or how to think. I leave that up to you. I, I offer you something and what you take away from it will very much depend on the baggage that you bring to it. Now. For some people, they say that that involves a lot of work in contemporary art, and contemporary art does. I mean, you know, it's it's not always spoon-fed. You, what you bring to it, will very much dictate what you take away from it. Which is not to say that it can mean anything at all, but I think what it stands for does not have to be. I don't think it needs to limit itself to being this or that in a particular way. At least that's what interests me as an artist. No, I think by choosing water and skin, you're choosing an incredibly loaded topic. Mm. And I, you know, I want to sort of, I just, so I agree with you completely mm. and I like your choice mm. and really appreciate what you've mm. done. So it's not about saying that you're doing something wrong or that. No, 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 <laughs> not at all. Uh, no, but I was just saying that, you know, very often um, when you take loaded topics, it sort of presupposes that you have to create agitprop art out of it, whereas I don't feel that way. Um, not, 
not really out of a neutrality of positioning, but just from the way I engage with things. Um, and that's why I feel the art is an extension of who you are as a person. I mean, I have friends or activists, artists who would, um, you know, make perhaps very sort of um, in-your-face works. But then again, I might argue that maybe something subtle might stay with you longer and make you think about things longer than something that sort of hits you in the face and shocks you. And um, the impact is there, but maybe you may not think about it for that long. So I'm not saying, you know, I really... Uh, I'm not straddling the fence when I say I don't think one is better than the other. I just think there are different forms of engagement, really. I, I truly believe that, that, um, you know, the monk who meditates can be as much a game changer as the soldier with a gun. That's why I said, I mean, it wasn't really, um, you know, when I, sh uh, an artist would come to see this, very often also in contemporary art, you might, you know, whether it's a political statement or whether it's a form of art, you might do it just for the sake of sort of saying, see what I can do or because it's fashionable. But for me, really, these explorations into photography and video are a way, it's an extension of the sketchbook, you know, mm -hmm. these things are, you know, they were, admittedly, it's, it's edited. There was sort of endless filming of this in my kitchen with, you know, um, and then this raw footage was taken and it was shaped. But yeah, it was just, you know, it was very, it wasn't an elaborate setup, I, which is not to say sometime in the future I may not do something like that. But at the moment, this is really an extension of the drawing pencil, if you like, of, you know, working with this and then, you know, finding a form in it, of playing with it. So was it completely a gorilla camera thing, or did you have something in mind? No, I did have this idea of the ch of identity and the changing nature of water mm -hmm. and the fluidity of water, and you know, water assumes whatever form you put it into, and all of that. So it sort of with this framework, then I played with you know with with flowing water, with water as ice, with boiling water, with bubbles, and sort of. Um, and I knew that I would show all these films in edited form. So I sort of had a framework, but then within that, I let the material do whatever it would do and capture it on, on the camera. So it was quite arduous, actually. Yes, <laughs> quite a lot of footage yes. to edit yeah. from. Yeah. Can I pose a question and ask, um, when you when you guys come here and you deal with contemporary art, what, what, what do you think of art? What do you think, what role do you think art can play or should play or might play um, in, in society today? In, you know, when you're studying a country or you're studying a people, do you feel art today has a role to play at all? That's another discussion. <laughs> <laughs> now the full session. But let me say the nicest thing that's happened recently is the is the arrival of public art in, in Thank India. Thank you. Because I thought for years it's the most mm -hmm. you know one of the most awful things about India is the, is the how art disappeared from yes. public spaces. So that things like this are coming up again. I know it's very nice. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, um, I think um, yeah. if no one has any questions, I'd um, like to say thank you to Harvey. Hope this could have been a, a you know we could have publicized this earlier yeah. so that more people could have come and um, listen to your perspectives on art. Um, mm -hmm. No wonder you were nominated for Women of the Year, Woman of the Year at the <laughs> Fedina Awards this year. Thank um, you. Thank you. And soon, hope we hope you win it. Who won it this year? Yeah? I, you know, was an uh, illustrator from oh. Delhi. Well, thank you for um, spending time. I've been told that uh, uh, 
um, as a token of appreciation, oh, I just you. would like to thank you. Thank you so much. Book. Now, thank you all of you for the opportunity to come and talk with you and for the questions and for the engagement. I really, really appreciate that. And it's, you always, you know, it's when you have debate that, you know, you think of things and you rethink things and you go away. And it, it really was wonderful. So thank you very much. And thank you too to Sangeeta. I mean, no, we haven't thanked you enough yeah. for thank coming you. on board and moderating thank this. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for everything. Thank you to the Institute of South Asian Studies for hosting this talk um, and for arranging it in such short notice, Johnson. Your work was invaluable. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.